So just a quick intro about me. Uh, my name is Emily, and I am a programmer. I used to work at Wayfair, uh, where I was a software engineer on the DevTools team. Um, and there I developed on several of our in-house tools that hooked into Git. And now I'm currently at the Recurve Center, where I'm pursuing some personal uh, code projects involving algorithmic art and data visualization. So for this workshop, Dissecting Git's Guts, we'll be doing a deep dive into how Git works under the hood. But before we begin, I wanted to get a show of hands. How many of you here use Git on a daily basis? Yeah, most, if not all of you. I think I saw all hands go up. Awesome. So I really like teaching this topic because programmers use this tool all the time, but most have a rather superficial understanding of how it actually works. XKCD makes a pretty funny joke out of this, of how for most people, Git is complete sorcery. And because of that, they are kind of left in the dark once they screw something up, right? So how many of you have had something go terribly wrong in Git? Yeah, I believe there's a term for that. Git happens. <laughs> Fortunately, knowing what goes on under the surface empowers you as it leads to a better intuition and thus a better ability to navigate the system in case something goes horribly awry or even in everyday use of the program. So that's what I hope you walk away from, uh, uh, from this talk with, a uh, just more comfort in using Git and a better conceptual understanding of the system. For example, what is at the heart of a branch? Or what is happening when you do a Git checkout? Or what is a detached head state? And the way I'll approach this talk is with the assumption that you're familiar with Git porcelain commands. So this is the term for all of the high-level commands that end users interface with on a daily basis. So you guys should know these. Uh, shout out some examples of these. Yes, clone, pull, what else? Push, add, status, fetch, branch. Yeah, tons, right? So while we're on the topic of terminology, on the flip side, you have something called Git plumbing. And we're not talking about toilets here. So plumbing is the term for all of the low-level commands that allow you to manipulate, inspect, or compare the basic structures of Git. And we'll use these plumbing commands to sort of poke around and dissect how Git is fundamentally structured. And this is how we're going to do it. First, we're going to walk through the concept of the .git folder, which is where the Git magic happens. And then we're going to drill in and look at the objects directory, which is where Git stores stuff. And we'll later move on to the refs folder to explore how Git aliases things. And lastly, we'll take a look at Git pack files, which is how Git saves space and we'll look at how that ties into the system's general structure. Does that sound good? Great. So the format of this talk is workshop style, which means that I'll lecture for a little bit. And then once we're at a good stopping point, I'll give you some time to explore the concepts we've just learned through a quick exercise. And while I'm in lecture mode, that is, while I'm talking, like right now, um, I simply ask that you just pay attention to the screen. Um, and you can feel free to take notes, but whatever you do, I really don't recommend that you sort of code along with me and copy what's on my screen uh, while I'm talking, since well, you'll, you'll miss out on some very key points, especially since I'll be moving fast. And especially since uh, the exercises will go over what I just covered. Um, and each of these exercises come with a cheat sheet for you to reference and use as a guide. So this is the colorful PDF file that I had you download before the class began. Um, does it, did everyone download that? Oh, that's totally fine. Um, so if you haven't downloaded it, um, no fear. Like When the exercises begin, you'll have a chance to. Um, and there is like a, a link right on the slides themselves, so don't worry whatsoever. 
Cool. Um, so also during these exercise and breakout sessions, we have two TAs on hand to help you out. Ed Thompson, wave high, and Nick Platt, wave high. Um, so feel free to call on any one of us. Um, and lastly, I know this tutorial is slated to last three hours. That seems like a super long time to, for anyone to sit through anything. So I'm aiming for all of us to, uh, to get done in close to an hour and a half and two, or two, around two hours. Sounds good? Great. So hopefully everything makes sense so far. So for those of you who are just sort of streaming in, um, no worries, we've only just gone through the introduction section, so this, the rest of this tutorial will still make sense. Okay, great. So let's walk, oh, whoops, forgot that slide. So let's walk through the Git internals from the ground up, starting with what makes a Git repository? Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna create a folder. And I'm gonna go into this folder. And I want to run a number of git commands on it, like git log. And I have git installed on my machine. So if I were to run this right now at this very moment, would this work? No, yeah, that's correct. Um, so the answer is no, but let's go ahead and try it just for demonstration purposes. Great, so I get a fatal error. That's because before you can perform project-specific Git operations on a folder, you actually have to initialize Git. And the way you do that is through a porcelain command. Does anybody know this command, by the way? Git init, great, awesome. So Git init puts in place the scaffolding that Git needs to operate on that project. Great, so now it says that there's a Git folder that's been created. But if you run an ls on it, you don't actually see it. But actually, let's do an lsla, which shows the hidden folders and files in a directory. L standing for list format and uh, to sort of make it pretty, and A to show all the files. And there you go, right? Now you see it. So the .git folder is what makes a directory a git repository. It's where everything that Git stores for a given project lives. And because of this, if you ever wanted to back up or duplicate a Git project, you can simply just copy over this hidden folder and you'd have all of the history intact. In fact, when you run a Git clone for a repo from a remote, uh, from a remote source like GitHub or GitLab, um, that is essentially all that you are doing, copying over this .git folder. Okay, so now it makes sense that the .git folder should be hidden to begin with, right? If this folder contains all of the vitals, you typically don't want people tinkering around with it. But we know what we're doing, so let's go ahead and run an ls uh, to see what git guts are made of. Not that ls would harm a folder or anything. Okay, great. So the parts that we're concerned about for this uh, workshop are the objects folder, the refs folder, as well as um, the head file, and then finally an index file that has yet to materialize. So these four things constitute the heart of Git's structure. And the rest of it is either, either personalized configurations or user-defined scripts that are beyond the scope of this talk. Who has gone into the .git folder, by the way? Awesome, a room full of intrepid explorers. Great, so let's all go exploring together and let's uh, go spelunking into this folder. So we'll start by diving into the objects directory. You might wonder, where does Git keep all of the different versions of my files, all of my content? And the answer is right here in the objects folder. So this is just a folder which functions as Git's database. And the term that you can use to describe how this database works is content addressable file system, which means just a method of storing information so that you can retrieve it based on its content. Wait a minute, so what does that mean? 
So this means that when you put something into Git's database, it spits back out a key so that you can then use it to retrieve this content at any given point. So let's do this. Let's put an object into Git's database. So I'm going to go and write a file. Hello world. I'm going to write hello world in it, because why not? I'm going to save this file. And now we're going to use a plumbing command called git hash object that allows us to copy over the files into our object's database. The w flag here indicates to git that you want to write it. And we pass in the name of the file that we want to store. OK? Uh, great. So now we get back this hash, this weird looking string of gibberish comprised of 40 hex characters. And in your time using Git, I'm pretty sure you've run into these. How many of you have seen these? Yeah. So where have you seen these? Log, yeah. Someone else said something. Rebase, yes. Huh? Pardon? Commit IDs. Commit IDs, yeah. Well, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, they're not always commit IDs, which is what we're going to learn. OK, so git log is probably the example that most of you, think you are thinking of. So this hash is generated by the SHA-1 algorithm, which is built into that hash object plumbing command we just used. And the hash it produces, for the most part, is uniquely generated based on the contents of the file. OK, so to drive home my point, I'm just going to run the raw SHA-1 function on this content on the command line to see for ourselves. So here we go. We're going to uh, prepend some metadata, file type, and size uh, here to match the fact that the hash object command automatically does it for you right before running the SHA-1 function. Pipe that into the uh, SHA-1 function. And there you go. For any given set of content, you reliably generate the same hash key. And you can really do this any number of times, and you will always get back the same hash for this content. But if you alter the content in any form whatsoever, and I'm just going to go ahead, I'm going to go into this and add an S to the end of hello world. Maybe you're, we are living in a multi-world universe, I don't know. And you can see how one little letter makes this hash entirely different. So this idea of getting a hash back that uniquely uh, matches with a set of content, kind of in the way that a fingerprint is a unique identifier for a person, this content is super important, as it's at the heart of what makes Git a content addressable file system. So then, let's use this hash to retrieve the content we just stored in the objects folder. Which, by the way, the objects folder looks kind of like this. I'm just going to show you the object, how it's stored. Um, you'll see that it's organized such that the first two hash characters creates a subdirectory under the objects folder, and the rem remaining 38 functions as the file name. And we can retrieve the contents by using the uh, plumbing command git cat file which allows you to inspect any Git object. The P flag here stands for pretty, as in a readable format. And we pass in the hash of the corresponding object. And there are the contents of the file. But actually, if you try to read this like any other text file, I'm going to try to cat this. what you end up seeing is complete gibberish, right? So the files that Git saves into its database uh, aren't just stored as raw file copies of what you have. That makes no sense, right? If you think about the fact that Git has to operate on potentially massive code bases, I think, for example, of my previous company, which had repos of hundreds of thousands of lines of code and just thousands of files. Um, it really would not be scalable. Rather, the contents are compressed into these much smaller objects. And Zlib is the compression library that they use. So now, to further explore how Git saves files into our directories, let's apply what you've just learned 
through an exercise. Uh, we're going to explore basic versioning. And so the point of this exercise is to examine how Git saves the different versions of your files into the Git database. And here it is. So the first part of the exercise from items number one through four, uh, we just did that. So you'll be recreating what I just did. Five through seven is new territory. So I strongly encourage you to pair um, just for one, so they can meet people. That's always fun. But for another, to discuss more in depth uh, what you've learned and sort of hash out the concepts. And as I said, if you didn't already download the cheat sheet beforehand, you can just go to my GitHub account, uh, uh, to the Git's Guts Commands um, repository. You can just open up the PDF from there. So I'm going to pick off uh, where we left off. As I said, I already went through items one through four. So we'll start on item number five, which is making version two of the same file. OK? So I'm going to go, I'm just going to clear the screen really quickly. I'm going to go and open up um, this Hello World uh, full, uh, file that I've made. I'm going to go ahead and stick an additional line into it, like you guys did. You stuck an additional line into your file. And I'm going to save this. And I'm going to write the hash object command to save it to my git database, pass in the name of the file, the same file here. And we get a different hash back, right? Because the content is modified, so a different hash must accompany it. So now, if we show the contents of our objects folder, and I'm just going to use a shortcut here for that find command we've been using. OK, so we see that there are now two git objects stored in the git database. And if we open up this object that we just created, what you see might surprise you. So it's the newest version of our file in its entirety. So when you sort of talk to your neighbor, um, as according to the instructions, and discussed what you thought you would see when you opened up this project, how many of you sort of guessed correctly? Oh, awesome. We got quite a few uh, correct deductions. So I taught a workshop version of this talk at my previous company. And in that time, I found that consistently, developers tended to think that version 2 of a file in the objects database would be a diff off of version 1. Who guessed that would have been a diff? Yeah, yeah. Who didn't know what to think? Yeah, totally fine as well. Um, so um, I think that some other version control systems, like Subversion, stores diffs. But Git is a different animal. For each version, it, copies, uh, it stores an entire copy of your file initially. There is, however, a follow-up to the statement, uh, but we'll get to it a little bit later on in the talk. So another thing to note is that Git uses the hash. To uh, we're done with the exercise, by the way, and we're moving on. So another thing to note is that Git uh, uses the hash to detect when a file has changed and will be thus more selective of when to store a new object. So if you try to store a file that is exactly the same, line for line, character for character, into your objects directory, it will detect that it already exists and it won't duplicate it. But it will spit back at you the same hash as you see here. And this is true, by the way, if you saved a dozen of the same files with a different name into your database. And really, that's part of Git's beauty. It's pretty space, oops. So as I said, it's true that you will get back the same hash. It won't save it if you saved a dozen of the same files with a different name into your database. And that's really part of sort of the space efficient way that Git is designed, OK? So this type of object that we've been talking about uh, and that we've been inspecting has a very specific name. And I very briefly, uh, very briefly mentioned it before. But for the sake of demonstration, we can use the plumbing command, cat file, uh, to inspect the object. And this time, we're going to pass in the T flag, type, so as to indicate type. OK, so someone read that out to me. What does it say? Blob, yeah. 
I just wanted to hear you guys say that. So blob, that is the name of these objects that we've been creating. And they are super important because they are the primary object store in Git, containing all of your file content. So how do we know what file name this blob goes with? Or how does Git represent saving multiple copies of a file under a different name? More importantly, what if we want to group a bunch of files together to create a snapshot? Because that's what Git is, right? It's not just a snapshot of one file, but of your entire folder at any given point. So there's another type of object for this that gives us this information of layer, uh, this layer of information we're looking for. Um, so we looked at blobs, and what we're going to look at now is called tree objects, OK? So whereas those blobs we saw correspond to your file contents, well, you can think of trees as the complete snapshot of your project directory. So we're going to make a tree to demonstrate. But first, we need to make an index file, because that's what Git makes trees from. So what is an index file? Well, you actually know what it is, because there's a user-friendly metaphorical term for, you use it, uh, for, for it that you see all the time. Does anybody know what that term might be? Reminds you of like the theater, I'm on one, stage, that's right, yeah. So staging area and index are one in the same. So to move forth, let's stage some files, aka putting stuff into our index by using the plumbing command, update index. And the add flag here specifies that we're adding to the index and we pass in the name of the file that we want to stage. And now, I'm going to go ahead and add just a, yet another file into our index, just for demonstration purposes. Foobar. Lots of gibberish. And so now I'm going to update index. And this time, I actually don't have to manually call hash object beforehand, because update index has that functionality built into it. If the blob isn't already there in the object's database, it will be automatically added under the hood. And now, if we look at the .git folder, we see that we now have an index, which was absent before. Okay? And if we inspect the contents of the index file with this plumbing command, which you will use, git ls, you can see that it's just a running list of all the stuff in our staging area. So this is all staging really is under the hood. And if you run a porcelain git status, you will see that we have indeed added stuff into our staging, git status. There it is, right? So by now, we've saved our files into the Git database and updated our staging. And you might have guessed which porcelain command we've basically done except with low-level plumbing. What is it? Add. add, git add, right. So this is all the low-level stuff that happens under the hood in a git add. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah. So now that we have an index, aka staging, for the tree object to base itself off of, let's go ahead and finally write that tree. Git write tree, that's the command which you will use. And as you would expect of all objects that you write to your objects folder, you also get back a hash. And let's examine this. Git cat file, p for pretty, Pass in the hash, and there you go. So this is what our tree object looks like. And you'll notice that it contains the file mode, the object type, blob, a reference to the SHA hashes of the blobs, along with the file name. One thing to note that isn't being shown here is that in addition to pointing to our blobs, trees can also reference other trees too, so as to illustrate this notion of a subdirectory. 
And if you were paying close attention, you might notice that this tree object, in fact, looks almost exactly like the index file we just looked at. And that's absolutely the case. It's very similar. So what's the difference? Well, unlike the index file, which is meant to be in a constant state of flux because it's your staging area and it gets changed around constantly, right? This tree object is a finalized snapshot captured and persisted into your Git database. Does that make sense? Okay. And you can see that this is the case, given that we now have another item in our object's database. Okay? Great, so now I'm going to give you 20 minutes to do exactly what I just did so that you can digest everything and do further exp uh, explorations yourself. And if you finish early, there's an additional challenge built in. And once again, I heavily encourage you to uh, turn to your neighbor and pair. So now it's official. We now have a snapshot of our current working directory stored into our Git objects folder. And that is, as you saw, the tree object. But it still seems like we're missing some metadata. You don't have any information about who saved these snapshots, what time they were saved, or why they were saved. So enter this concept of the commit object, OK? So let's create a commit object. We'll use the plumbing command commit tree. So I'm just going to echo the commit message and pipe it into this commit tree command. We're going to pass in the SHA hash of the tree object. And like with all objects that we've dealt with so far, we get a SHA hash back. And Git predictably sticks it into the object's database, as you can see. Great, so now we have more stuff in our objects database. And if we take a look at this, tree, uh, this commit object, we'll see that it looks like our typical commit. So this is pretty familiar, right? This is familiar to all, yeah? So very importantly, we have the hash of the tree object that this points to. We have the author, which is me. We have the committer. Oh, that's also me. And then we have timestamps. And finally, the all important commit message. I really botched this commit message. I hope none of your commits look as vague and general as this. OK. So as of now, by writing a tree and creating a commit object off of it, what high-level git porcelain command have we now effectively recreated using low-level commands? Git commit, that's right. So we've now done the low-level workings of a git commit. That's pretty awesome, right? Yeah. So let's put another commit on top of this one, because I want to demonstrate how git relates commits to one another. Let's say that I've edited the file foobar for this commit, Add another line, more gibberish. The sky is blue. OK, not so gibberish. Fubar, but that's gibberish. Save this file. I'm going to update my index. And now I'm going to write the tree. I'm going to echo my second commit message. I also botched this. <laughs> pipe this into my git uh, commit tree plumbing command. And here, uh, I'm just going to pass in the SHA hash of this tree. And here, I'm going to chain the commits. So the P flag here stands for parent, telling it to link this commit to a parent commit, the one that comes before it, so as to indicate a sense of hierarchy. And we get this hash back, which is what we expect. So let's take a look at this commit object that we've just created. So looks pretty similar to the previous commit that we made, right? However, there is one thing that's different. Does anyone notice what's different here? Parent, that's right. So it says parent whoop, along with the hash of that previous commit. 
And now, if you run a git log on the specific commit hash, you, pass, uh, you write stat because you're doing that on a commit, um, we'll see that how by simply chaining these commits, we're actually starting to build up a commit history. That's awesome, right? OK, so now it's your turn to create a commit object. And I will give you all 15 to 20 minutes. And again, if you finish early, there is a challenge uh, discussion. So I'm actually forcing you to chat with your neighbor this time. I know I keep saying collaboration is great, but now I'm making you do it. OK, so who got to the challenge question? Raise your hand. OK, don't worry about this next part, this next quick bit, if not. Uh, but raise your hand, uh, wait, so raise your hand if you think that a new commit object will be created. Now raise your hand if you think a pre-existing commit will simply be altered. Raise your hand if you have no idea what to think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so when you perform a, a git commit amend, who the way does that, uh, who by the way does that a lot? I do it like constantly, it's hilarious. <laughs> Um, so when you perform a git commit amend, you end up creating a new commit object. Because remember, git always needs a file name associated with a SHA hash, which is generated uniquely based off of the contents, right? So it's git's way of verifying data integrity. So once you change a commit message for the commit object, the contents of that commit object are now completely different. So the SHA hash ends up completely different. And you can't just reuse the SHA hash from the one before, right? OK? Anyway, there you go. Um, and by the way, this prior commit object with this old message will actually still exist in the object's database, but it will just kind of dangle around completely useless. And it eventually gets removed. Yes? Yes, you, absolutely you could. Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe in a bigger way with like garbage collection, is that right? Yes, that is absolutely correct. That is absolutely correct. Yes? Exactly, that is exactly, yeah. Whenever stuff like this happens, ref, ref log is your, um, is your go-to. Me and ref log are buddies. Yeah, <laughs> me too, actually. Um, Awesome. So anyway, th those are really good points that were brought up. You can look at the ref log. And also, um, it is a useless object, but eventually gets removed during a garbage collect, which we will go into further in detail in a little bit. OK, makes sense to everybody? Great. So anyway, there you have it. You've now performed all of the low level. Uh, uh, you've performed a low level git add and a low-level git commit. And if you were following along, you'd probably notice the very tree-like way that git is structured. And I'm going to go ahead and do a high-level overview of git structure um, as you've seen it, so that you can sort of congeal all of this or sort of weave all of this together, OK? So at the very lowest level, we have the contents of our files, which is the blob. And each revision, as you saw, was a different blob. And then you have another layer built on top of that in order to associate the files in a snapshot, which is the tree object. And then on top of that, we have another layer of metadata, the commit objects, which are chained together for the purpose of forming a history. And everything is chained in one direction by the usage of hashes to point from one node to the next. The children always knows its parents and never the other way around. And if you drop anywhere on this chart and follow the pointers, you will never end up back where you started. Thus, it's a DAG, directed acyclic graph, which is a graph that contains no cycles. Who's heard of this term, by the way? Awesome, computer scientists in the room. And these hashes, are generated based on the file contents, which in turn, as you saw, contains the hashes of any preceding nodes. This creates a chain of dependencies in which the hash of each uh, subsequent object depends on the one before it. 
In this way, Git is also structured as a Merkle tree. Who's heard of the term Merkle tree before? Fewer people, it's more obscure, um, but actually, as I, uh, it, it turns out that this is the same structure that Bitcoin bases itself off of. Pretty cool. And as it's both a DAG and a Merkle tree, some like to call it by the hybrid name of Merkle DAG. Okay. So regardless of what you can, what you decide to call it, you can see what advantages this type of structure might hold. For one, because of the hashing in that the key is uniquely generated based on its contents, you can verify that the data you put in will always be the data that you get back out, which is a way to, as I said, maintain data integrity. If there's any corruption, Git will absolutely notice it, okay? And at the same time, it allows for deduplication of any common children, which I mentioned earlier at the blob level, right? Save any file, same file, but different file name, you're gonna get just one object back, okay? For another, it makes for a highly flexible, super fast piece of software, given that we can content address any of the nodes in the data structure, because you have all of the content, and it's just a matter of pointing to it all via the hashes. Which brings us to our next point, which is references. So now we know that Git stores our information in three primary object types. What are they? At the very lowest level, what do we have? Blobs. Then what do we have? Trees. And then on top of that, commits. Awesome. And it's all just kind of floating around in the objects directory. Yes, there it is. Um, but when we work with Git, how do we keep track of what commit we want to work off of? Well, usually, what are we working in? Branches, branches right. So there's our answer, branches. But what exactly is a branch? How does Git know what objects go with a given branch? And it's actually extremely simple. Branches in Git are merely aliases or pointers to commit objects, okay? And these pointers reside in the folder dot git slash refs slash heads. Refs meaning references and heads meaning the top level commit for a given alias. And this directory should contain a running list of all the branches that are in this repository, but as you see, it's completely blank, right? That's because we don't have any branches yet. But let's change that. So we can use the plumbing command git update ref to do so. And we pass in the name of the branch that we want to make, master, and the commit object that we want it to point to, which was the last commit we just made. And now, if you list your dot git slash ref slash heads folder, you see that you now have a master branch inside of it, okay? And if you open this guy up, <coughs> bless you. You'll see that all it really is, it's just a text file because I could cat it. Um, it just contains a hash of the commit object that this branch points to. So in effect, what we've done is this. Oh, okay, yes. Oh, oh, goodness. Okay, there we go. So we've created a reference to the commit, okay? So that's all there really is to a branch, really. Now, oftentimes, when you are working in Git, you are branching off of master. So actually, let's try that. Let's branch off of master and see what happens. Git checkout, B, create a new branch and check out to it, feature. I hope your branches are a little bit more specific sounding than feature. Okay. Um, oh, okay, so it's all done running. So,
what, where am I? Oh, okay, yeah, so you see that now we've created, uh, now we have another branch in our uh, branch uh, heads folder, right? Um, and if you open up this branch to see the hash, what do you think you'll see, by the way? Same, yes. You'll see that the hash is exactly the same as the one for master. So we've effectively created two references pointing to the same commit. And visually, it looks something like this. Here's your master branch. You're going to check out to a new branch. That's what it looks like, OK? So that's what happens when you freshly branch off of master. But let's say that I've edited some files and then added a commit on top, as this is normally what we're doing when we're working on a new feature branch, right? I'm going to edit the hello world file, add some more lines to it. The sky is blue. It's the truth. Actually, is it blue? Well, whatever. Um, I'm going to do some. I'm going to do some porcelain git add, just to speed things up here. I'm going to do a git commit. Terrible commit message once again. Okay, and now if you open up the branch file, what happens is that the branch now points to a new commit. Right? Um, and if you take a look at the git log, you'll see that the top hash corresponds to the latest commit. And now it's all chained. It's chained to all of the preceding commits. OK? So visually, it looks something like this. We changed a file, and then we staged it. And then we committed it, which creates a commit object and links it to the prior commit. And at the same time, it moves the branch reference so that it now points at this new commit object. And if you wanted to check back out to master and get your master revision back, what would happen is that Git would read the master branch file, which would contain the commit hash. And from there, it follows the chain of hashes through your trees until it gets to the relevant blob objects. And from there, it unpacks those blobs into your working directory. OK? So you're probably wondering now, well, how does Git know what branch we're currently working on? So that when we do a Git commit, like we just did, how do we know what branch to move that commit to? And the answer to that, who knows it, by the way? Who can guess? OK, I'll tell you. The answer to that is the head file which resides on the top level of your .git folder. And this is just a text file that points to the path of your branch. So if you cat it, there it is, right? Just points to your branch. So git log, git branch, along with a bunch of other commands that you run when you want to info on your current branch, reads off of this file. I think some of you earlier on were trying to do a git log without the dash dash stat um, and passing in the uh, commit object, you can't actually run like a git log unless you have like your head file pointing to a branch file. That's why it didn't work beforehand. Okay. So anyway, um, when you bring the head file into the picture, the diagram kind of looks like this now. I, I kind of ran out of space there. Okay. So. When you do a checkout to another branch, under the hood, you edit the head file so that it then points to that new branch that you're checking out to. So if I were to check back out to master, what would happen? Yeah, head file would move to master, yeah. And by the way, you've probably also seen the term detached head state floating around. Who's seen that term? Isn't it the funniest term ever? Like, what does it mean? It's very memorable. Uh, so if you're wondering what that is, it's when you do a git checkout to a commit that no branch points to. That's a detached head state, OK? Does that make sense? OK. So the overarching point that I really want to make here is that branches are not some fleshed out entity. I used to think that they were, right? Rather, they are literally just a text file with a pointer to a commit hash in it. And we do this because we need a human readable and meaningful way to reference the commit object that we want to work off of. 
Because those 40 hex character hashes are seriously hard to remember, right? Yeah, you can't remember that. But we'll certainly remember something like master and feature, actually hopefully a better branch name than feature. Okay, so we now have another exercise where you can go ahead and explore doing what I just did. I feel like the challenge will have too many results, so there's no like one right answer to this. Does anybody, did anybody go through the challenge and want to sort of, um, uh, sort of talk about what they discovered? If anyone found anything interesting? Any brave volunteers? I think I see a hand. Okay, awesome. Stand up if you want or just talk loudly or I can come and awkwardly share my mic with you. Mm -hmm. um, I did find that um, bit space area still has a certain file, so it's mm -hmm. still some HMIP that I created. Mm. Nothing got cleared out from there. Interesting. And did your working directory get updated to reflect what was uh, on the new commit that you changed to? In the new commit, um, I didn't actually examine all the files directly, but I'm assuming since this says it's still showing my change. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, awesome. Anyone else want to uh, share like some weird things or cool things or interesting things that they saw for the challenge? Cool, awesome. Thank you for sharing. What is your name? Uh, Nathan. Nathan. Thanks for sharing, Nathan. Okay. Cool. Um, so one last topic, and that is Git pack files. So I mentioned earlier that Git saves a copy of each and every version of your file, right? So if that's the case, you might start thinking to yourself, geez, that would become pretty clunky pretty fast, right? You're probably all thinking that, yeah? Yeah. So let me just show you. I'm just gonna find, look at my objects database. <laughs> I don't know what I was doing, okay. So yeah, look at this. This is the smallest repo ever, but it already has this many objects. How does the scale, right? So what I've been showing you is loose objects. So the thing is that Git sometimes automatically packs those loose objects up into a binary file called pack file in order to save space and efficiency by using deltas or diffs, right? I think I said at the beginning that like, yeah, Git doesn't use diffs, but there's a follow-up to that. This is my follow-up, okay? So we can actually manually reenact this process through the git gc command. And the gc here, what does that stand for? Who knows? Garbage collect, that's right. So with garbage collect, Git performs a rather complicated algorithm to determine which of these objects are similar, and then picks a base to then make the deltas, which is the difference between the objects, and stores that instead, which saves quite a bit of room. So before we run this command to start packing things up, let's run a git count objects to see what we have. So the H flag here stands for human readable, as in like pretty, make it readable, okay. And we see that we have a count of 11 loose objects for a total size of 44 KB. So now, if we run git gc, okay, so is it counted objects, then did delta compression, and now if we count the objects, you'll see that um, we have way fewer loose objects hanging around, and the total size has significantly shrunk. Yes? Counting objects, oh. Maybe this is saying it's counting the, I, actually, I don't actually know, but maybe it's saying it's counting the objects that it can diff off of. Do you, does anyone here know, perchance? Huh? Unpacked objects only. It counts unpacked objects only. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, perfect, yeah, I think I got, I got rid of the V because I didn't want to like clutter the point, but okay, cool, yeah, you guys can run dash V and see. 
uh, so dash V, and then you can put the capital H there to see it in human readable form as well. OK, thank you for that. OK, so now um, we've seen how it like, significantly shrunk. This is like way less space, which is awesome. And if we do a find on our database again, you'll now see something entirely different. So the pack file, which is the guy on the last line, is the single file containing the deltas. And the index immediately above contains offsets into that pack file to quickly reference objects. And if you run a plumbing command, git verify pack dash v, you'll see that all of the things that have been packed up, and there it is. This is all that's been packed up. And that's it for how Git saves space and manages to stay even more space efficient. Yes? If you scroll back up and you see the object that you have just compressed, yep. it looks like it's not compressing code. OK. I can't actually sc uh, scroll back up because it's a recording. Um, so you're saying that, oh, wait, I see what you're saying. Oh, rat, rats, OK. The object at the top is probably head. OK. Oh, hmm. Head. Uh, so you're saying in this slide, right? Was it, is it this one? Yeah. When you find them all. Yep. Oh, yeah, yep. That, that would make a lot of sense. You probably don't want to compress the, uh, the com like, thing that you're currently on. Very good. OK. Awesome. So actually, um, that kind of concludes my workshop for how Git works. Um, so I hope I've managed to make um, Git demystified for you. Uh, but really, the best way to learn about this topic, if you're interested, is to go and dig for yourself. So I wanted to share some of the resources that I've used and always relied on over the years. Um, the first item is ProGit by Scott Chacon and Ben Straub. It's a really amazing, uh, an amazing open source book. And you've probably seen it floating around online when you've Googled for Git help. Who's like seen this, by the way? Yeah, it's a really great book. Um, so if you learned um, a lot from this talk, you'll learn even more from reading the source, as it is my Git Bible. And I've structured a lot of the talk around some of its content and drew from its really brilliant explanatory approaches. So I'd like to give a lot of credit to this book. Other perspectives on Git internals is Mary's, Mary Rose Cook's Git from Inside Out and Josh Weigley, who explains from Git from the bottom up. Uh, so there are many ways of tackling the same question. And a particularly great talk I found is by Matthew McCullough, I think that's how you say his name, if you're more of a video learner. And if you wanted to learn even more about Git pack files and Git GC, since I like very briefly went through that, um, you should check out a fantastic article by Aditya Mukherjee, uh, who's, uh, who also did the Recurse Center. Um, and that's published in Recurse Center's Code Words. And lastly, I recently discovered this really gorgeous blog post by Tyler Cipriani, a Cipriani that does a very thorough job visualizing Git's Merkle DAG structure in D3. And next, I wanted to thank everyone who um, helped me in preparing this talk by providing an audience for a dry run and offering feedback. And I'd also like to give a round of applause for our TAs, uh, Ed and Nick. Thank you. Hey, this is super helpful. Couldn't have done this without you guys. Um, and Ed, by the way, it will be giving a similar 40-minute talk on Thursday at 4.20 in Ballroom G called Deep Dive into Git. So I highly suggest that you attend, not only because Ed is awesome, but also because it's really great to hear two perspectives of explaining the same topic in order to really come to understand it, OK? Um, and next, I wanted to thank the sound person for being awesome and on point and sort of like rolling with the punches. So everyone, uh, applause for the sound person. Uh, sorry, what's your name? Cable. C Cable? Cable, let's, uh, let's all applause Cable, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and of course, I wanted to thank you for being a great class. Um, so if you have any questions or feedback, I can take them. Uh, also, feel free to tweet at me at any time. I'll respond there. I like Twitter. Huh? Post your slides, please. 
post my slides. Um, so I guess my, uh, my concern with the slides is that they, uh, it, it's massive because it's all rec like the recorded videos that I put into the slides directly. So you might not be able to, I might not be able to post them. I'm gonna try to find a way to, and I'll post a link to it in that repo, um, the dissecting get. I'm gonna make a, I'll make a PDF of it, but I'm not sure, if, yeah, you probably might not be able to get the video in. But I'll, um, Oh yeah, I could do that actually. Um, yeah, I'll do that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, actually, that's a good idea. I'm gonna do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so actually, uh, I did do a talk, uh, basically the same talk at a conference called Git Merge. Um, which is like the Git conference. Uh, so if you wanted to see like essentially the same thing minus the exercises and minus like some silly commentary here and there, um, you, you'll be able to find it um, if you search for Git Merge's 2016 videos. Um, I think they'll post them in the next cu couple of weeks so you can rewatch the talk there. Um, and I will post them up. It will be in um, the, that repo that I sent you to with the PDF cheat sheet. Um, and maybe I, yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe I'll also post a link to the uh, talk itself, um, the, the Git merge talk in that repo. So just check that repo out. Yes? Just go back a couple slides to show the resources. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, awesome. I hope you all had fun. I had a blast. Okay, awesome. Great. <laughs>